improve governance capacity through the socialist system with Chinese characteristics. February 17th, 2014. Main points of the speech at a provincial level officials seminar on studying and implementing the decisions of the third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee on Continuing Reform. To keep up with the overall progress in the national modernization process, we must improve the CPC's capability for scientific, democratic, and law-based governance, and enhance the efficiency of government departments. We must improve the general public's ability to manage state, social, economic, and cultural affairs in accordance with the law. In this way, party, state, and social affairs will be administered in accordance with rules, standards, and procedures, and we will become better able to govern the country through the socialist system with Chinese characteristics. The third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee pointed out that the overall goal of continuing the reform to a deeper level is to develop the socialist system with Chinese characteristics and modernize our national governance system and capacity. This is a prerequisite for adhering to and developing socialism with Chinese characteristics and for realizing socialist modernization. Since the introduction of the reform and opening up policy some three decades ago, our party has begun to ponder the issue of national governance system from a new perspective and come to the conclusion that the issues of leadership and organizational systems are fundamental, comprehensive, stable, and permanent ones. Today, we are tasked with an important historic mission, that is, to make our socialist system with Chinese characteristics more mature and better established, and provide a set of more complete more stable and more effective systems for the development of the party and the nation, the well-being of the people, social harmony and stability, and the enduring prosperity and stability of the country. This is a grand project. It entails carrying out all-round and systematic reform and integrating reform in various fields to promote the overall modernization of our national governance system and capacity. A country's governance system and capacity are the major barometers of its system and that system's governing efficiency. The two are complementary. Our governance system and capacity are good overall and have unique advantages. Moreover, they suit our national conditions and development needs. Nevertheless, our national governance system and capacity still have much room for improvement, and we should exert greater efforts to enhance our national governance capacity. Our governance system will become more efficient as long as we focus on improving the party's governance capacity while raising the moral and political standards, scientific and cultural levels, and professional abilities of officials at all levels and administrators of all areas, and as long as we make party and government agencies, enterprises, public institutions, and social organizations more efficient. 
we must understand that the overall goal of continuing the reform to a deeper level consists of two aspects, that is, to improve and develop the socialist system with Chinese characteristics, and to modernize our national governance system and capacity, to accelerate the modernization of the national governance system and capacity, we must follow the socialist path with Chinese characteristics. The kind of governance system best suited for a country is determined by that country's historical heritage and cultural traditions and its level of social and economic development. And it is ultimately decided by that country's people. Our current national government system has been developed and gradually improved over a long period of time on the basis of our historied heritage, cultural traditions, and social and economic development. Our national governance system needs to be improved, but we should have our own opinion on what improvements are necessary. The Chinese nation is open-minded. Over centuries, we have been continuously drawing on others' strengths and shaping the character of our own nation. Without unwavering confidence in our system, we cannot have the courage to further reform. And without continuous reform, our confidence in the system cannot possibly be full and long-lasting. Continuing our reform to a deeper level involves improving our socialist system with Chinese characteristics. When we say boosting our confidence in the system, we do not mean to be complacent. Instead, we should continue to eradicate drawbacks in the system and make it more mature and enduring. To modernize our national governance system and capacity, we should foster and promote the core socialist values and the relevant system and accelerate the building of a value system that fully reflects the characteristics of China, the Chinese nation, and the times. Footnote 1. The system of the core socialist values was introduced in the resolution of the CPC Central Committee on major issues regarding the building of a harmonious socialist society, which was adopted at the 6th Plenary Session of the 16th CPC Central Committee in October 2006. The system includes the guiding thoughts of Marxism, the common ideal of socialism with Chinese characteristics, the national spirit centering on patriotism, and the spirit of the times highlighted by reform and innovation, as well as the socialist maxims of eight honors and eight disgraces. End of footnote one. To safeguard our value system and core values, we must let culture play its due role. A nation's culture is a unique feature that distinguishes that nation from others. We should delve deeper into and better elucidate China's excellent traditional culture and make greater efforts to creatively transform and develop traditional Chinese virtues, promoting a cultural spirit that transcends time and national boundaries, and has eternal attraction and contemporary value. We should also present to the world China's contemporary creative cultural products that carry both our excellent 
traditional culture, and contemporary spirit, and that are based in China and oriented towards the outside world. As long as the Chinese people pursue lofty virtues generation after generation, our nation will be forever filled with hope. Producing a good document is only the first step in the long march of thousands of miles. The key is to implement the document. We should meticulously and strenuously study and promote the guiding principles of the third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee and gain a solid understanding of continued reform. While studying the document, we should not stop at the surface, quote it out of context, copy it mechanically, or apply it blindly. We should straighten out the relationship between the general policy arrangement and a particular policy, between a policy chain and a link, between top-level policy design and policy interfaces at different levels, between policy consistency and diversity, and between long- and short-term policies. We cannot replace the whole with any part, nor can we compromise principles for the sake of flexibility or vice versa. While implementing the document, we should avoid empty talk, hesitation, or seeking quick success and instant benefits. We should implement it with a very strong sense of urgency and responsibility. Reform is a gradual process. We should make bold breakthroughs while advancing step by step so as to ensure the realization of the reform goals. Continuing all-round reform to a deeper level is aimed at serving the overall basic and long-term interests of the country. We should avoid picking reform areas according to personal preferences and should get rid of reform-hindering mindsets. We must firmly carry out reform that benefits the party and the people and contributes to prosperity and long-term stability. Doing this will enable us to fulfill our historic mission and our responsibilities to the people, the country, and the the nation. Economic Development Economic growth must be genuine and not inflated. November 30th, 2012 Main points of the speech at a symposium with non-party members held by the CPC Central Committee. Since the beginning of this year, China has been confronted with a complex international economic situation, as well as the demanding tasks of reform, development, and stability. By taking a scientific approach to development, we have focused on transforming our economic growth model. Following the general guideline of making steady progress, we have acted promptly to improve macro control and placed more emphasis on sustainable development. So far, we have seen positive results in many areas, including steady economic growth, adjustment of the economic structure, reform to a deeper level, and improvement of the people's well-being. Although we have a generally positive analysis of China's economic and social development, 
we must not underestimate the risks and challenges facing us now and in the near future. We must be aware that the pace of world economic growth will continue to be slow. The problem between sluggish demand and overproduction capacity continues to grow, and domestic companies are troubled by rising costs and weaknesses in their capacity to innovate. The conflicts between the environment, natural resources, and economic growth are becoming more serious. Every coin has two sides. We must see both the advantages and disadvantages in the international and domestic situations. Make full preparations for adversity and strive to get the best possible results. Next year will be the first full year to see the implementation of the decisions made by the party's 18th National Congress. It is very important to do a good job of our social and economic development. We should focus on improving the quality and efficiency of economic growth, make steady progress, encourage innovation, lay a solid foundation for future development, press forward with reform and opening up, and realize sustainable and healthy economic development together with social stability and harmony. First, we must maintain reasonable economic growth by continuing with our proactive fiscal and prudent monetary policies and increase the natural vitality and motive force that drive economic growth. We must pursue real rather than inflated economic growth. In other words, we want efficient, high quality, and sustainable growth. Second, we must consolidate the position of agriculture as the foundation of the economy. Increase support for agriculture improve our policies that benefit farmers and bring prosperity to them, accelerate modernized operation of agriculture, and ensure the supply of grain and other important agricultural products. Third, we must make substantial progress in economic restructuring, expand domestic demand while stabilizing external demand, intensify our industrial restructuring and upgrading, and promote well-planned and healthy urbanization. Fourth, we must carry out reform to improve the socialist market economy, have a good top-level design, carry out timely and targeted reform measures, Combine steady progress in overall reform with breakthroughs in specific areas, experiment boldly, and pursue substantial results. Fifth, we must improve the people's standard of living with a particular focus on low-income groups, provide subsidies to poor students in colleges and universities, keep the employment market steady while doing all we can to expand it and improve the urban and rural social security system. We will encourage the people to achieve prosperity through hard work, thereby combining the aim of the party and the government's work with the goals that ordinary people strive for. Open wider to the outside world. April 8, 2013. Main points of the speech at a discussion of representatives 
of Chinese and foreign entrepreneurs during the Boao Forum for Asia Annual Conference 2013. Footnote 1. The Boao Forum for Asia is a non-governmental and non-profit international organization with a fixed conference date and a fixed address. It was founded in Boao, Hainan Province, China, on February 27, 2001, with equality, mutual benefit, and cooperation as its themes. The BFA bases itself in Asia and aims to expand economic exchanges, coordination, and cooperation among Asian countries while enhancing dialogue and economic ties between Asia and the rest of the world. End of footnote one. The prospects for China's economic development are bright. China will make greater contributions to the world as it pushes forward reform and opening up, accelerates the transformation of the growth model, implements the opening up policy, and provides a better economic environment and favorable conditions for foreign enterprises. Entrepreneurs, who are also the main participants of this forum, are an important force in creating jobs and wealth and in promoting development and cooperation. Your decision will have a major impact on the Asian economy as well as the wider world. I would like to take this opportunity to listen to your views and exchange ideas with you. The world economy is still in a phase of instability and uncertainty, and recovery will be a lengthy process of advances and setbacks. In contrast, economic growth in Asia is relatively robust. In this context, China's economic prospects have become an issue of universal interest. I would like to share with you my views on this topic. China has maintained sound overall economic development. Its growth will continue in the foreseeable future as industrialization, informationization, urbanization, and agricultural modernization greatly expand the domestic market. The basics of our social productive forces remain solid. Our advantages in productive factors are obvious, and our management and control systems and mechanisms continue to improve. At the 18th CPC National Congress, we set the two centenary goals as our objectives and committed ourselves to the Chinese dream of the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. We will continue to inject new energy into the Chinese economy as we strive to realize these objectives and the Chinese dream. As a result of our endeavors, we can be very optimistic that the Chinese economy will maintain a relatively high growth rate. China will shift its development focus to improving the quality and efficiency of growth and make every effort to promote a green, circular, and low-carbon economy. The Chinese market operates fairly. Every company is registered in China. Every company registered in China is an important component of the country's economy. Our commitment to the socialist market economy will remain resolute. We will continue to enhance 
the rule of law, and actively improve our investment environment so that all enterprises can enjoy equal access to the factors of production, market competition, and legal protection. And the Chinese market can become fairer and even more attractive. Our policies of utilizing foreign investment and protecting the legitimate rights and interests of foreign enterprises in accordance with law will not change. China will never close its door to the outside world. Over the past 10 years, it has fulfilled its promises to the WTO by creating a more open and standardized business environment. We will open up new areas and enable deeper access. Our economy will remain open to foreign investors, and we hope that other countries will extend the same access to Chinese investors. We firmly oppose protectionism in any form, and we are willing and ready to solve economic and trade differences with other countries through consultation. We actively promote the establishment of a multilateral trade system characterized by balanced and mutually beneficial development. China's domestic development benefits the rest of the world and first of all its neighbors. In 2012, Almost 16 million Chinese people traveled to our neighboring countries in East and Southeast Asia. China has made a substantial contribution to Asia's economic development. In the next five years, China's imports will reach U.S. $10 trillion worth, and its outbound investment is expected to grow rapidly. China is making great efforts to increase its connections with its neighbors to the advantage of both the regional and the world economy. China remains committed to reform and opening up, and we will improve the relevant policies. We will continue to improve the capacity and quality of our services and provide a better environment for foreign entrepreneurs to invest and launch ventures in China. We hope that foreign enterprises will seize these opportunities to achieve further development. The Invisible Hand and the Visible Hand, May 26, 2014. Main points of the speech at the 15th Group Study Session of the Political Bureau of the 18th CPC Central Committee, which she presided over. We should let the market play the decisive role in allocating resources while allowing the government to better perform its functions. This is a theoretical and practical issue of great importance. A correct and precise understanding of this issue is very important to further the reform and promote the sound and orderly development of the socialist market economy. We should make good use of the roles of both the market, the invisible hand, and the government, the visible hand. The market and the government should complement and coordinate with each other to promote sustained and sound social and economic development. The third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee pointed out that economic structural reform 
is the focus of continuing the reform comprehensively. The underlying issue is how to strike a balance between the functions of the government and the role of the market, and let the market play the decisive role in allocating resources and the government better perform its functions. The proposal to let the market play the decisive role in allocating resources is a breakthrough in our party's understanding of the laws governing the development of socialism with Chinese characteristics, as well as a new achievement in the sinicization of Marxism. It symbolizes that the socialist market economy has entered a new stage. To let the market play the decisive role in allocating resources and the government better perform its functions, we must have a good understanding of the relationship between the role of the market and that of the government, which represents a core issue in our economic structural reform. The third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee changed the market's role in allocating resources from basic to decisive. Although only one word was altered, the market's role was redefined. Decisive role is a continuation and extension of basic role. Letting the market play the decisive role in allocating resources and letting the government better perform its functions are not contradictory. It does not mean that the market can replace the government's functions nor vice versa. Actually, this is an effort to keep our economic reform targeted at existing problems. For more than two decades, our socialist market economy has been developing, yet there are still quite a number of problems and drawbacks that inhibit the vitality of market entities and prevent the laws of the market and value from fully playing their roles. If these problems are not solved properly, it will be difficult to establish a well-developed socialist market economy, further transform the development model, and adjust the economic structure. We should remain committed to the reform to establish and improve the socialist market economy and bring the reform to a deeper and wider level. We should reduce the government's direct involvement in resource allocation and its direct interference in microeconomic activities. We should step up efforts to develop a uniform market system characterized by openness and orderly competition and set fair, open, and transparent market rules. The government should refrain from getting involved in the economic activities that the market can regulate effectively and let the market do what the government is not supposed to do so that the market can play its role of maximizing the effectiveness and efficiency of resource allocation. And enterprises and individuals can have more room to develop the economy and create wealth with vigor and vitality. Scientific macro control and effective governance are the intrinsic requirements for giving full play to the strength of the socialist market economy. To ensure that the government better performs its functions, we should transform government functions. Further, the reform of the administrative system, use new administrative methods, improve the macro control system, and enhance the monitoring of market activities. We should strengthen and improve public services and promote social fairness, justice, and stability, as well as common prosperity. 
governments at all levels should exercise administration strictly in accordance with the law and conscientiously fulfill their responsibilities. The government should manage well all matters that fall within its purview and appropriately delegate powers that should be delegated. The government should make resolute efforts to avoid overstepping its bounds or failing to play its due role. We should uphold the party's leadership and let the party play its role as the leadership core in exercising overall leadership and coordinating all efforts. This is an important feature of our socialist market economy. Over the last three decades since the introduction of the reform and opening up policy, we have made market achievements in our social and economic development and the people's living standards have improved noticeably. These successes are attributable to the fact that we have firmly upheld the party's leadership and given full play to the roles of party organizations at all levels and of all party members. In China, the party's strong leadership is the basic guarantee for the government to play its due role. While comprehensively continuing the reform, we should uphold and develop our political advantages and use them to guide and push forward the reform. We should motivate all the people to make constant efforts for a better socialist market economy. In the new situation today, officials at all levels, especially leading officials, should continue to learn through practice and put what they have learned into practice, study new problems, and draw on new experiences. They should learn to correctly use both the invisible hand and the visible hand and become experts in balancing the relationship between the government and the market. Transition to Innovation-Driven Growth June 9, 2014 Part of the speech at the 17th General Assembly of the members of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the 12th General Assembly of the members of the Chinese Academy of Engineering. Currently, all party members and people of all ethnic groups are striving for the completion of the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects and the realization of the Chinese dream. The 18th CPC National Congress put forward an important plan for the implementation of an innovation-driven strategy and emphasized that scientific and technological innovation is pivotal to improving social productivity and the comprehensive national strength. So it must be put in a core position in our overall national development. This is an important strategy made by the CPC Central Committee following a general analysis of the domestic and international situations and of the overall picture of our development. The 21st century heralds a new round of scientific, technological, and industrial revolution. Global scientific and technological innovation has exhibited new trends and features. Cross-disciplinary integration is accelerating. New disciplines continue to emerge and scientific frontiers keep spreading. 
significant breakthroughs are being made or expected in basic scientific fields, such as the structure of matter, the evolution of the universe, the origin of life, and the nature of consciousness. Widespread diffusion of information, biological, new material, and alternative energy technologies has brought about a green, intelligent, and ubiquitous technological revolution. The boundaries between research into basic and applied sciences, technological development, and industrialization in the traditional sense are becoming increasingly blurred. The chain of scientific and technological innovation has become more flexible. Technology upgrading and conversion have become quicker, and industry upgrading continues to speed up. Scientific and technological innovation is constantly transcending geological, organizational, and technological limitations. It intensifies the competition between innovation systems and makes innovative strategic competition more important in the competition for comprehensive national strength. Scientific and technological innovations, like a fulcrum which is said to be able to lever the earth, always create miracles. This has been proved in the development of contemporary science and technology. In the face of the new trends of scientific and technological innovation, the world's major countries are seeking to make new scientific and technological breakthroughs and gain competitive edges in future economic as well as scientific and technological development. We cannot afford to lag behind in this important race. We must catch up and then try to surpass others. Since the introduction of the reform and opening up policy some three decades ago, China has made remarkable achievements in social and economic development. Its economy has leapt to number two in the world, and many of its major economic indices rank high on the world's list. Nevertheless, we must be clear that our economy, though large in size, is not strong. Its growth, though fast, is not of high quality. The extensive development model featured by economic growth mainly driven by factor inputs, such as natural resources, is not sustainable. Now, the total population of well-off countries in the world is about 1 billion, while China has more than 1.3 billion people. If we are all to become modernized, the well-off population must more than double. If we are to consume as much energy in production and daily lives as the present well-off people do, all the existing resources in the world would be far from enough for us. The old path seems to be a dead end. Where is the new road? It lies in scientific and technological innovation and in the accelerated transition from factor-driven and investment-driven growth to innovation-driven growth. A few days ago, I read an article which argued that the third industrial revolution would be a robot revolution. It asserted that robots would change the pattern of the global manufacturing industry, and China would become the world's largest robot market. The International Federation of Robotics predicted that the robot revolution would create a market value of trillions of U.S. dollars. Hardware and software for producing robots has become increasingly mature. 
The production cost keeps dropping and the functions robots can perform are more diversified thanks to the integration between robot technology and the new generation of information technology, such as big data, cloud computing, and the mobile internet, and the rapid development of 3D printing and artificial intelligence. Military unmanned aerial vehicles, self-driving cars, and home service robots have been put into application. Some artificially intelligent robots have pretty sturdy self-thinking and learning ability. Robots are dubbed pearls on the crown of the manufacturing industry. A country's achievement in robotics research, development, manufacturing, and application is an important yardstick with which to measure its level of scientific and technological innovation and high-end manufacturing. Major robot producing companies and countries have stepped up their efforts to gain advantages in terms of technology and markets. I couldn't help wondering, China will be the largest robot market in the world, yet can its technology and manufacturing capability sustain it through the competition? We should make better robots and seize bigger market shares. There are many such new technologies and new fields. We should size up the situation, take the overall picture into account, and make plans as soon as possible, and implement them solidly. To carry out the innovation-driven strategy, the basic thing for us is to enhance our independent innovation ability. And the most urgent thing in this regard is to remove institutional barriers so as to unleash to the greatest extent the huge potential of science and technology as the primary productive force. Most importantly, we should unswervingly follow an independent innovation path featuring Chinese characteristics, stick to the guiding principles of independent innovation, leapfrogging development in key sectors and development supported by science and technology and oriented towards the future, and speed up the pace of building an innovative country. Years of painstaking efforts have resulted in great progress for China in science and technology. And China has entered the advanced ranks in the world in some important fields. In certain fields, it has become a forerunner or parallel runner instead of a follower. China has entered into a vital period when new industrialization, application of information technology, urbanization, and agricultural modernization are forging ahead simultaneously, in parallel or interactively. This has created ample space and an unprecedentedly strong momentum for independent innovation. I have repeatedly said that the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation can in no way be realized easily. In fact, the stronger we become, the greater resistance and pressure we will encounter. That's why we say that timing and resolution are vital, as historical opportunities are often ephemeral. Now we have an important historical opportunity to promote scientific and technological innovation. We must not miss it but seize it tightly. We are blessed with a solid material foundation laid over the 30 plus years of reform and opening up and the fruits of persistent innovation, which are favorable for the innovation driven strategy. Hence, we should take the initiative and adopt a proactive strategy 
as to scientific and technological policies of great strategic value to our country and nation, we should make up our minds and act without any hesitation. Otherwise, we will let slip the historical opportunity and may even have to pay a higher price. In March 2013, I talked about scientific and technological innovation at a group discussion with scientists during the first session of the 12th National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Generally speaking, the foundation of our scientific and technological innovation is not solid enough. Our independent innovation ability, especially in the area of original creativity, is not strong. We still have to depend on others for core technology in key fields. Only by holding key technology in our own hands can we really take the initiative in competition and development and ensure our economic security, national security, and security in other areas. We cannot always decorate our tomorrows with others' yesterdays. We cannot always rely on others' scientific and technological achievements for our own progress. Moreover, we cannot always trail behind others. We have no choice but to innovate independently. Facts prove that it is self-sufficiency that has enabled the Chinese nation to stand among the world's independent nations. And independent innovation is the only path to the summit of science and technology. With this understanding, we should waste no time in making a difference. We cannot keep on talking year in and year out, but do nothing about making a drastic change. Of course, we don't mean to make independent innovation behind closed doors or all by ourselves. We shall never reject good experiences from others, from any part of the world. We should engage in international scientific and technological exchanges and cooperation more proactively and make good use of both domestic and international resources. Science and technology are global and time sensitive, so we must have a global vision when we move forward. Currently, important scientific and technological breakthroughs and their accelerated application are highly likely to reshape the global economic pattern and change the nature of industry and economic competition. In traditional international playgrounds, the rules are set by others and we play games by the established rules. Seizing the important opportunities made available by the new scientific, technological, and industrial revolution means that we should be part of the games. And yet we can play a major role in the construction of the playgrounds, even at the beginning, so that we can make rules for new games. We will not have a chance if we are not capable enough to be part, indeed a major part, of the construction team. Opportunities are always for those who are fully prepared and for those who are independent-minded aspiring and persevering. We cannot move forward by leaps and bounds unless we do so with innovation. Geoscientist Li Xinguang said, Science exists because of new discoveries made by it. It would die without new discoveries. Footnote 1. Li Xinguang, 
1971, was a famous Chinese geologist and one of the founders of China's geomechanics. End of footnote one. Footnote two. Li Si Guang. What have geologists done in the scientific front line? The Complete Works of Li Si Guang, Volume 8, Chinese Edition, Hubei People's Publishing House, 1996, page 243. End of footnote 2. French writer Victor Hugo said, Things created are insignificant when compared with things to be created. Footnote 3. Victor Hugo on William Shakespeare. End of footnote 3. The direction of our scientific and technological development is innovation, innovation, and more innovation. We should attach great importance to breakthroughs in basic theories, step up the construction of scientific infrastructure, continue to push ahead with basic, systematic, and cutting-edge research and development, and provide more resources for independent innovation. We should actively integrate and make good use of global innovation resources. In response to our current and future needs, we should selectively participate in the construction and use of the world's major scientific appliances and research and development bases and centers. We should seize strategic opportunities in key scientific and technological realms, select strategically important segments and priority areas relevant to overall and long-term development, and promote collaborated innovation and open innovation through effective and rational resource allocation. We should build an efficient and strong supply system of key generic technology, work hard to make great breakthroughs in key technology, and hold key technology in our own hands. A person with sharp ears can hear sounds others cannot, and a person with keen vision can see things others cannot. Footnote 4. Sima Qian. Records of the Historian. Shi Ji. Sima Qian. Circa 145 or 135 to unknown BC. Was a historian and writer in the Western Han Dynasty. The book, China's first biographical style, historical and literary masterpiece covers more than 3,000 years, from the legendary Yellow Emperor to Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty. End of footnote 4. There is no end to scientific and technological innovation. Scientific and technological competition is like short track speed skating. When we speed up, so will others. Those who can skate faster and maintain a higher speed longer will win the title. Shun Ji asserted, If a gallant steed leaps only once, it can cover a distance of no more than ten steps. If an inferior horse travels for ten days, it can go a long way because of perseverance. If a sculptor stops chipping halfway. He cannot even cut dead wood, but if he keeps chipping, he can engrave metal and stone. Footnote 5. Shunzhu, 325 to 238 BC, 
was a philosopher, thinker, and educator of the late Warring States period. He believed that man could conquer nature and that human nature was evil. His book, Shun Tzu, summarizes and develops the philosophical thoughts of Confucianism, Taoism, and Moism in the pre Qin dynasty period. End of footnote 5. Footnote 6. Chun Tzu. From the book Chun Tzu. End of footnote 6. Our scientists and engineers should bravely shoulder their responsibilities, overtake others, and find the right direction to which they should stick. They should have the courage and confidence to blaze new trails, overcome difficulties, and seek excellence, and audaciously make world-leading scientific and technological achievements. The implementation of an innovation-driven development strategy is a systematic project. Scientific and technological achievements can generate real value and pay off only if they meet the needs of the country, the people, and the market, and only after they have gone through the stages of research, development, and application. I have been wondering about the reason why our science and technology gradually lagged behind from the late Ming, 1368 to 1645, and early Qing, 1644 to 1911 dynasties. Studies show that Qing Emperor Kongzi was very interested in Western science and technology. Footnote 7. Emperor Kongzi 1654 to 1722, ruled the Qing Empire from 1661 to 1722. End of footnote 7. He invited Western missionaries to give him lectures on astronomy, mathematics, geography, zoology, anatomy, music, and even philosophy. More than 100 books on astronomy were introduced to him. When did he study these subjects, and for how long? He continuously studied them for two years and five months, sometime between 1670 and 1682. He began his study quite early and learned quite a lot. The problem was that, at that time, Although some people were interested in Western learning and learned quite a lot of it, they did not apply what they had learned to social and economic development. Rather, they simply talked about the knowledge. In 1708, the Qing government asked some foreign missionaries to draw a map of China. It took them 10 years to complete the map of Imperial China, the first of its kind at that time. However, this important work was confined to the Imperial Storehouse as a top secret document away from the public eye. Therefore, it had no impact on social or economic development. But the Western missionaries who had drawn the map took the data back to the West and had it published. Hence, for quite a long time, the West knew China's geography better than the Chinese people did. What can we learn from this story? It means that science and technology must be combined with social development. No matter how much one has learned, it cannot possibly have any impact on society if the knowledge is merely put aside as a novelty, refined interest, 
clever trick, or doubtful craft. For years, our scientific and technological achievements could not be smoothly converted to productivity. Why? Because there were institutional bottlenecks in the scientific and technological innovation chain and loose connections between the various links in the innovation and conversion process. It is like a relay race. The second baton carrier is not there or has no idea of where to head when the first arrives. To solve this problem, we must further scientific and technological system reform, change mindsets, and remove institutional barriers hindering scientific and technological innovation. Properly handle the relationship between government and market and better integrate science and technology with social and economic development. We must open a channel through which science and technology can boost industrial, economic, and national development. We must spur innovation with reform, accelerate the construction and improvement of a national innovation system, and let the well water of innovation gush out fully. If we compare scientific and technological innovation to a new engine driving our development, reform is an indispensable ignition system with which to start the engine. We should take more effective measures to improve the ignition system and let the new engine run at full speed. While carrying out the reform of the scientific and technological system, we should prepare ourselves to solve difficult problems and implement the relevant decisions made at the third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee. We should put scientific and technological innovation in the center of our overall national development. Speed up the preparations for the innovation driven development strategy and draw roadmaps and timetables for important tasks in this regard. The reform of the scientific and technological system should be carried out at the same time as social and economic reform. We should reform the planning and resource allocation mechanism for the national scientific and technological innovation strategy, improve the performance evaluation system and incentive policies for officials, further cooperation between industries, universities, and research institutes, and solve key problems obstructing the conversion of scientific and technological achievements as soon as possible. We should vigorously improve coordination in scientific and technological innovation so as to avoid fragmentation and isolation, as well as overlapping and repetition in campaigns launched by departments in various fields. We should set up a national innovation system within which experts in all fields can interact and collaborate to achieve high efficiency. We should improve the infrastructure of scientific and technological innovation, build and improve the natural scientific and technological reporting system, and make innovations in the survey system and national scientific and technological management information system as soon as possible, so as to maximize resource sharing. We should deploy the innovation setup around the industrial setup, as well as the capital setup around the innovation setup. We should focus on national strategic goals and pool resources to tackle key scientific technological problems pertaining to the national economy and the people's livelihood. 
We should move faster to improve the basic research system with the focus on cutting edge basic research, key common technology, and high tech for public welfare and that of strategic importance. We should double our efforts in completing important national scientific projects and race to the front of international scientific research. While centering on scientific and technological innovation, we should also accelerate innovation in product, brand, industrial structure, and business model. We should carry out the innovation-driven strategy throughout the modernization process. While furthering the reform of scientific and technological systems, we should pay attention to a magic wand vital to our success, our socialist system. We have made many noticeable achievements in science and technology this way. This practice must not be given up. We should let the market play a decisive role in allocating resources and the government play its role better. We should step up planning and coordination as well as collaborative innovation. We should pool our efforts to accomplish big tasks and focus on important cutting edge and basic research. To accomplish extraordinary feats, we must wait for extraordinary persons. Footnote 8. Ban Gu, the book of the Han Dynasty, Han Shu, also known as the book of the Western Han Dynasty, Qian Han Shu. This was the first chronological dynastic history of China. Ban Gu was a historian in the Eastern Han Dynasty, 25 to 220. End of footnote 8. Competent personnel are the most crucial factor for scientific and technological innovation. Respecting them has long been a fine Chinese tradition. As described in the Book of Songs, King Wen of the Zhu Dynasty respected competent people who hence flocked to him so his country became strong and prosperous. Footnote 9. The Book of Songs, Shi Jing, was the earliest collection of poems in China. It contains 305 poems collected over some 500 years from the early Western Zhou Dynasty, circa 11th century to 771 BC, to the middle of the spring and autumn period, 770 to 476 BC. End of footnote 9. Footnote 10, King Wen of Zhou, dates unknown, also known as Ji Chong, was the founder of the Zhou dynasty. End of footnote 10. They are the most important factors for a country's long-term development. We need them for our great national rejuvenation. The more talented, the better. The more knowledgeable, the better. China is a country rich in manpower and wisdom. The wisdom of our 1.3 billion people is our most precious possession. Knowledge is power, and competent personnel shape the future. If we want to get to the forefront of global scientific and technological innovation, we must discover, nurture, and retain such people throughout the whole process of innovation. We must train a large number of high-caliber creative scientists 
and engineers. We are proud of having the greatest number of scientists and engineers in the world. Nonetheless, we face a serious structural deficiency of innovative scientists and engineers, particularly world-class and other leading and high-caliber ones. The education and training that our engineers have received so far are not geared towards production and innovation. If you want one year of prosperity, then grow grain. If you want 10 years of prosperity, then grow trees. If you want 100 years of prosperity, then you grow people. Footnote 11. Guanza. Guanza. Circa 720 to 645 BC, also known as Guanzhong, was a reform-minded official of the state of Qi during the spring and autumn period. End of footnote 11. We should make human resource development a top priority for scientific and technological innovation. We should improve the mechanism for training, recruiting, and using competent personnel. We should work hard to foster a contingent of world-class scientists and engineers and other leading and high-caliber ones, as well as high-level innovation teams. We should focus on training young, innovative scientists and engineers for the front lines. We should perfect our competence nurturing mechanism according to personnel development laws. We should respect a tree's nature and let it grow freely. Footnote 12. Liu Zongyuan, Tree Planter Hunchback Guo. Liu Zongyuan, 773 to 819, was a writer and philosopher in the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907. End of footnote 12. We should not seek quick success and instant benefits or try to help young shoots grow by dragging them up. We should encourage both competition and cooperation and promote a rational and orderly flow of competent personnel. We should attract outstanding experts and scholars from overseas for our scientific and technological innovation. We should create a social environment that encourages innovation and values success while tolerating well-intentioned failure. We should improve the competent personnel evaluation system and create ample space for such people to give full play to their talents. The future belongs to the young. Innovative young people are the source of our creativity, and the best hope for our scientific and technological development. I beg old man heaven to bestir himself and send down talented people of more kinds than one. Footnote 13. Gong Zhen, Miscellaneous Poems of 1839. Ji Hai Zha Shi. Gong Zijin, 1792 to 1841, was a thinker, historian, and poet in the Qing Dynasty, 1644 to 1911. End of footnote 13. Academicians should not only be pioneers in scientific and technological innovation, but also guides for young people. I hope that they will shoulder their responsibility in nurturing young scientists and engineers 
instruct them through words and actions, and continuously discover, train, and recommend competent personnel so that innovative people can stand out from the crowd. Young scientists and engineers should be dedicated to science, develop innovative thinking, tap innovative potential, and enhance innovative ability. They should continue to push ahead while learning from previous generations.